uh, honored to introduce to you Mr. Stephen Barnes. He is the co-founder of the Hong Kong uh, Visa Center. Stephen graduated with honors, a degree in law from the London School of Economics in 1992 and successfully completed the solicitor's final examination at the Law Society of England and Wales in 1993. Having lived in Hong Kong since 1987, he has exclusively practiced immigration in Hong Kong since graduating law school. And in 1996, he wrote and hosted the internet for, uh, on the internet for free, the definitive practical guide for business immigration uh, in the HKSAR, and now published on one of his four Hong Kong visa and immigration websites, hongkongvisahandbook.com. A regular guest on RTHK, the public broadcaster in Hong Kong, Stephen frequently offers commentary on business immigration live on air and is um, this time the best of his knowledge and the only person presently credited for the Law Society of Hong Kong to deliver CPD programs on the topic of business immigration and HKSAR. Uh, Stephen will provide us uh, with an overview of immigration law in Hong Kong with, with the constantly shifting COVID quarantine and eligible travelers, uh, welcoming foreign talent and businesses, enhancements of the national security law background check. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you, Cindy, and good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you, sharing with you for 15 or 20 minutes, my favorite subject, uh, Hong Kong immigration. So we will sort of start off with the ramifications of um, visitors and residents coming to Hong Kong predicated on the fact that we've got a zero COVID policy here, which uh, impacts somewhat significantly on your ability to, to move freely across our boundaries and to get into Hong Kong by the airport. I'll touch then briefly on the what are the four main sort of immigration state I that are used by foreign nationals to be able to pursue their sort of residence objectives in Hong Kong. Um, I'll speak to the fact that we do have an open door policy, nothing's changed uh, as a result of uh, recent uh, adjustments to national security law arrangements here. Um, and I'll also then just have a, a minute or two on uh, sort of what's perceived to be a bit of an exodus from Hong Kong as a result of the national security law and the availability of the British national overseas. New visa arrangements in the UK um, for VNO passport holders. Um, if you are thinking about coming to Hong Kong, uh, you would no doubt have uh, looked really carefully on the government website to see what the arrangements are as regards being able to physically enter. Well, uh, it's quite a complex sort of um, matrix of different uh, arrangements, depending on where you're traveling from, what your vaccination status is and, and other things. Um, but uh, for all practical purposes, it breaks down into whether you have to do seven days quarantine, 14 days quarantine, 21 days quarantine, whether you can do that quarantine at home or whether you can or you have to do that quarantine in a designated quarantine hotel. So presently, we're uh, broken down into three categories. We've got high risk category, which avails, uh, requires a 21 day uh, quarantine arrangement in a designated quarantine hotel. We have, uh, and the USA is, uh, is a high risk category A, uh, group A country presently. Uh, we have medium risk category B, uh, and Canada is a category B country presently. That's a 14 day. Uh, designated quarantine hotel arrangements and then you have uh, low risk which at this point in time is only one uh, jurisdiction uh, New Zealand non-Chinese jurisdiction which is New Zealand uh, which requires seven days in the designated quarantine hotel. Uh, home quarantining arrangement is only available to those travellers coming from uh, Macau and China and who are vaccinated. And there are different arrangements in place as to whether you're a Hong Kong resident or a non-Hong Kong resident. Uh, similarly, uh, if you're coming from Taiwan, it's a 14 or a 20 day, 21 day designated a quarantine hotel arrangement, uh, again, depending on your vaccination status and otherwise. Uh, there are some schemes afoot that uh, are making it easier to uh, cross the border between China, the boundary between China and Hong Kong. Um, the return to Hong Kong, um, that's for Hong Kong residents, and the come to Hong Kong uh, scheme for uh, residents of China that want to come and avail of themselves in Hong Kong without needing to undergo uh, 
the formal quarantine upon arrival. There are challenges getting back into China as a result of having come to Hong Kong under the return to Hong Kong or come to Hong Kong arrangements. But in very broad terms, uh, the zero COVID policy is making life very difficult for people to um, get here uh, easily uh, at will. And uh, Entail some considerable delays to your planning because of the limited number of designated quarantine hotel slots available. So good planning is required if you're uh, planning to come to Hong Kong, but you can come. Uh, the borders are not completely closed, but if you are coming from the USA as a category A uh, country, you, as a visitor, you're not permitted presently, irrespective of your vaccination status. So, as I say, some planning is required. So the door is open. The immigration department is still uh, accepting applications and processing, that, processing applications in exactly the way that they've always done pre-COVID. Um, the main four visa types that I'm going to focus on are heads of, Im of immigration activity that lead to the grant of particular visas predicated on your rationale for wanting to come here. Um, I'll just go through those briefly and then just say a word or two about permanent residency, which requires a full seven years of continuous ordinary residence in Hong Kong uh, after having held a temporary, so to speak, uh, visa for seven years, uh, availing you of the opportunity to adjust your status and become a permanent resident subsequently. So um, the, the four main visa types are uh, the employment visa issued under the general employment policy for professionals. Uh, and this uh, entails also those individuals who are perhaps moving to Hong Kong uh, on the basis of being intercompany transferees working for a foreign organization that's got a business operation that's well established in Hong Kong who's in a position to support and sponsor the incoming intercompany transferee for an employment visa. The uh, test for approval for an employment visa under the general employment policy is that the applicant must possess special skills, knowledge or experience of value to and not readily available in Hong Kong. But more broadly, the compensation must be um, broadly commensurate with market rates paid to similar professionals in Hong Kong, which I guess is similar to all other jurisdictions. And that um, for the most part, the immigration department needs to be satisfied that no local person can reasonably be expected to uptake the work that's proposed for the foreign national employment visa applicant. So on the basis that they are a professional and otherwise all matters are um, properly addressed, generally speaking, these visas are being issued without any challenges, without any problems. And um, there are a little bit longer processing times as a result of uh, national security law more detailed background security checks that are ongoing now. Uh, but otherwise, it's business as usual for any professional that wants to be in Hong Kong to take up employment. So that's the first visa type that represents probably in normal times about 17,000 approvals each year that uh, facilitate the inbound um, traffic of foreign national professionals to take up residence here. So the second visa type that uh, is used by foreign nationals to engage in business here is the business investment visa as an entrepreneur. And uh, this requires that the applicant be able to demonstrate to the immigration department satisfaction that they can contribute substantially to the economy of Hong Kong. And that's the test for approval. In broad terms, what does this mean? Well, it means that the immigration department are looking for what I've couched as the three legs of the approvability stool. As long as these three components are in place and addressed and are persuasive in the context of the plan for the business that is driving the application for the visa in the first place, the immigration department are amenable to granting approvals for this particular visa type. So this is um, well, the first leg of the approvability stool is that uh, through the plan for the business, there must be a clear pathway to the creation of local employment opportunities. Typically, substantial contribution to the economy of Hong Kong precludes those foreign nationals who want to come and establish sort of, you know, one man consulting enterprises. For the most part, there has to be um, a plan for jobs in the offing uh, in order to get this visa. 
the second leg of the approvability stool is the immigration department expect to see that there is a properly set up office in Hong Kong. This is the language from the policy. And the properly set up office used to be a big, big uh, bugbear, um, arguably the most expensive component of getting the visa uh, approved. However, thankfully, we've got uh, over the last seven or eight years, we've developed a significant ecosystem of core workspaces here. So core workspace arrangements, which are relatively cheap and cheerful to set up, um, mean that a properly set up properly set up office can be uh, suitably addressed uh, with a minimum of fuss uh, to pursue the visa application. So that's the second leg of the approvability stool, as it were. And then the third leg is really what I've counted with resources, two types of resources. There's funding resources and there's resources which speak to sustainability of the business. So funding resources, this is really all about demonstrating to the department you've got sufficient financial means to, on the one hand, commercialise your business plan and on the other hand, ensure that you've got sufficient financial means to be able to meet your financial commitments as they fall due. The quantum isn't fixed by policy, but a million Hong Kong dollars, generally speaking, which is about 120, 130,000 US dollars, that generally ticks the box. So it's not a particularly um, expensive program to need to fund to, to get this visa for. Um, but necessarily the actual quantum that the immigration department wants to see is a function of the business plan. Um, so if your business plan clearly calls for more capital than that, then you obviously need to have a million Hong Kong as a minimum and then a clear sort of path to being able to procure the rest to ensure that your business plan is properly actionable. And then the other side of the coin in terms of resources is the Resources which speak to the sustainability of the business. The immigration department are not going to approve uh, this particular visa type if they're not satisfied that the numbers that are promulgated in the business plan are not capable of being achieved in fact. They, they don't want to see the business fail for want of commercial uh, prosecution. So there has to be something sensible um, put before them that speaks to your ability to actually deliver on the numbers that go to make up your plan. So in broad terms, that's what the immigration department are looking for when it comes to this particular particular visa type. It's, a, it's an arduous process. It's a four to six months, normal processing times. Um, it's the, the immigration power can be a little bit picky and choosy depending on how the economy is. They're being a little bit picky at the moment, so they're not making it easy. Generally, when the economy is flying, they, they're a little bit, uh, let's say, more, cons um, they're, they're more liberal in the grant of the visas, but at the moment they're being a little bit more conservative. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but we're still getting these visas approved. There's not as many of them around these days as there were uh, prior to you know, the troubles starting in 2019 for obvious reasons. Uh, but I think once we get our borders open again, we'll see a significant uptick in those visa types coming across our practice. Uh, the third visa type is really uh, supportive of the first two in as much as uh, they are available for family reunion. And um, there are two particular visa types that avail family reunion in Hong Kong. One is the dependent visa and the other is uh, an out of policy program that the immigration department have put together based on prolonged visitor consent for uh, de facto spouses who haven't recognized their relationship in any legal fashion. Uh, and these non-traditional relationships um, are afforded some measure of recognition by the immigration department because they don't want to separate families. But it does have the operating difference uh, on the visa type as to who can work and who can't work, depending on which visa type that you hold. So the visa type for married uh, couples, heterosexual or same sex, or whether their relationship is recognized via a legal marriage or whether it's recognized by uh, some other uh, civil partnership or, or, or other instrument that uh, legally recognizes their relationship in the jurisdiction where it was celebrated. Uh, these people can qualify for dependent visas on the strength that the Hong Kong uh, resident visa holder that's seeking to sponsor the family member can demonstrate to the immigration department satisfaction in broad terms that they can put a roof over the head and food on the table of their family member that's accompanying them after residence in Hong Kong. The uh, situation for unmarried partners is the prolonged visitor visa. 
the prolonged visa visa is granted in six monthly increments. They are uh, readily extended every six months whilst they're in Hong Kong. Uh, however, the difference between the two is that under the dependent visa, which requires legal recognition of the relationship, privilege to work is availed. Under the prolonged visitor visa for de facto spouses, the uh, holder doesn't get the privilege to work. So there is a quite a powerful difference between the two uh, types of visas, depending on you know, the status of the relationship with the sponsoring uh, Hong Kong resident visa holder or the applicant for the Hong Kong resident visa. So that's the family reunion dimension addressed. And then there are a number of permutations on the employment visa typically stated that uh, are also available in Hong Kong, depending on whether, for example, you studied in Hong Kong and graduated from a registered tertiary education institute here uh, with a, a degree, either a bachelor degree or a master's or a postgraduate degree that avails you direct access to and no questions asked, no employer required automatic employment visa at the end of your period of study upon proof of uh, your graduation from the university here in Hong Kong under the immigration arrangements for non-local graduates. That's a very flexible visa type and it does provide a kind of a pathway to um, employment status for some individuals who might otherwise not be able to qualify to secure an employment visa as a professional. So that's one kind of permutation on the employment visa. There's another permutation that's designed specifically for um, mainlanders, residents of the mainland, under a program called the Admission Scheme for Mainland Talents and Professionals. Um, this is very much like the employment visa that's issued to uh, other foreign nationals under the general employment policy, uh, but it has a, a higher uh, bar to entry because uh, there's plenty of people in China that would like to come and live and work in Hong Kong, so the immigration department don't make it particularly easy for them to um, uh, secure this status. They have to uh, typically have a master's degree or at least a bachelor's degree with a minimum of five years postgraduate graduation working experience in the case of possessing nearly a bachelor's degree and the sponsoring employer in Hong Kong must be a very well established company um, and then there's the training visa which allows you to uh, secure a status in Hong Kong for between six and 12 months to uh, undergo training in Hong Kong for uh, particular skills that are otherwise not available outside of Hong Kong. And again, you need to have a well-established uh, employer sponsor to uh, sponsor those training visas, but you can get permissions to come to Hong Kong specifically for training under a permutation of the employment visa. Uh, and then one other status that's available for existing employment visa holders that have um, been able to secure a two-year limited stay uh, on a prior, prior application and have that status available to them at the time that they apply for what's known as top tier status. And basically what that means is if your taxable uh, salary income in the most recent tax period was 2 million Hong Kong dollars or more, then you can apply to uh, extend your current employment visa and remove any sponsorship requirement from your current limited stay and secure a six year uh, one time extension under the top tier scheme. So uh, that's a program that is particularly useful for those individuals that uh, um, have the means to earn out those kind of incomes and, um, and then get a, a, an immigration advantage thereafter, which gives them a kind of a, a, a clear sort of, you know, immigration pathway through to the seven year requirement uh, of continuous ordinary residence in Hong Kong to be able to subsequently qualify for permanent residency after seven years. So okay. that's... Yeah. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Actually, this is a super interesting, uh, idea, uh, you know, opportunity that you're mentioning. Um, are there any opportunities to secure this passive investment for residency visas in Hong Kong? Is that the one you just mentioned before, or is there another one that is uh, available to uh, potential immigrants? Well, we used to have a passive investment for residence program, uh, which was initiated in 2003, but was postponed indefinitely. And I'm not sure that we'll ever see the light of day again, uh, called the Capital Investment Entrance Scheme, which is where you effectively put 
10 million Hong Kong dollars into qualifying investment asset classes, uh, waited two to two and a half years to get to the back of the queue. Uh, and then all things being equal, if the immigration department were happy with you, they would avail you of this um, capital investment entrance scheme visa, which was basically uh, yours for seven years on the basis that you maintained your, your ring fence qualifying investment um, in these uh, particular uh, assets in Hong Kong that qualified for the visa. That's gone now. So there is no formal passive investment for residents visa at this moment in time. But there are some creative ways to um, skirt around that quite properly. Uh, and uh, I have one or two of these that occasionally come, my desk, I come across my desk. So if anybody's ever interested in that, then uh, I can have a, an offline conversation with them about it. But no, fundamentally there isn't. But like all good lawyers, there's always a way to get things done. Right. Thank you so much again, Steve.